anyways, um, my name is Nick DeRazio. I'm the director of corporate strategy for Inven Global, and I have been. Good. Hello. Oh, okay, let me great. mute myself now on this. Muted. That's uh, fun. Thanks. So I have been looking forward to this talk for some time um, because I think there's a lot of a speculation and there's a lot of con kind of confusion on what makes an esport like popular. Um, so just for full um, disclosure, I wrote this column back in 2018. Um, I really enjoyed writing it. It was super fun. And then one of my uh, a colleagues agreed with kind of my um, ideas on what makes an eSport um, uh, popular. So he made this fantastic uh, video that pretty much goes through everything. So first thing I'm going to do, just kind of to set the stage of this, I'm going to play this video. It's super quick. It's like three uh, minutes. Uh, then I'm going to dive into uh, kind of the topics and why I think they're important. So without further ado, let's just watch this video uh, that gives a very, very brief outline of what we're going to be talking about. Okay, let's go. Counter Strike, Battleground, Charcon, Smash Brothers, StarCraft, and Overwatch. So if you don't speak Korean, you're going to have to read the subtitles. There's me. So, this is the first part, right? The first part, oh, and this clip is so good. Watch this clip from uh, a FaZe Clan versus Fnatic. This was 2018. Um, it turned into a FA versus one scenario, and Guardian absolutely destroyed. Um, I'm going to let this clip play out for a bit until I pause and then go back to the lecture. Bam, one kill, one kill, one kill. So part of why um, we're going to start with this is because the most common thing that I hear when people are trying to figure out what makes a successful esport is some people say luck. Um, they say, oh, it's just, you know, there was that boom period back in like 2005 or whatever, and whatever games were popular then, they just so happen to be the most popular games now. I don't think that's true, though. I think that it's possible to uh, predict uh, which esports titles have the highest chance to succeed. And when I say succeed, I really mean uh, survive. Um, in esports, we all know that it's very easy to have flavor of the month games or even flavor of the year games in which all attention is on them and they're the largest esports ever. However, I think the esports that really, really define this industry, the esports that people think about and talk about, and most importantly, the esports that create uh, these influencers and these pro players that are rapidly uh, dominating the discourse around video games, is the esports that endure, the ones that survive. I mean the ones that go on for more than five years, more than ten years, right? Now, I think they have something in common. Um, I think that these enduring esports, maybe by accident, or maybe just by luck, or maybe because they were made during the golden age of gaming, as as they say, they all have something in common. So the first thing that they have in common is they allow incredible feats of skills to sometimes trump everything else. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, this is why I first showed that Guardian clip and why um, you guys should definitely uh, check it up. Um, uh, check it out. This is a moment in uh, a CSGO in which one one player was able to kill five players. Now it was completely improbable that normally doesn't happen, even so much as the commentator in this match called it a done round. Oh, okay, there's no chance. But there was a chance. Now when a game is able to have these moments, it's because at its very core, the gameplay and design, it rewards uh, a player skill. It rewards player mastery above all. And there's no sort of hard uh, numbers or hard uh, balance that makes it so there's no way under any circumstances could one player um, defeat five. Now, we've seen that in games that I personally think had potential to be enduring esports, but won't. One of, I think, the perfect examples of this is World of Warcraft a PvP. Now, when you're just going on this, the surface level, this is every a hallmark of what could be a really enduring esport that 
makes tons of money and all of their pro players are super famous because I mean it's World of Warcraft it's one of the most popular games ever made it's Blizzard and this is its eSport but here is what I think is the big problem if you've ever watched World of Warcraft eSports there's this thing that happens is it it's 3v3 in the moment one player dies I mean seriously the moment one player dies the round is over the casters know the round is over the audience knows the round is over even the players know the round is over. I've actually seen in World of Warcraft esports a broadcast, the moment one player dies, they actually immediately switch to player cams and they start talking about the next round. Now, if you compare this to this moment here, right, that never happens in CS. That never happens in CS. There's never a moment in which, oh, okay, well, I guess both of my teammates are dead, so there's nothing I can do. So again, the enduring esports, they um, allow these comebacks to happen. Think Super Smash Brothers Melee with four stock uh, comebacks, right? Think uh, um, any Street Fighter game, right? You have that tiny a sliver of health, but you still make the comeback. I actually think this is very, very important. Um, when your game allows incredible feats to trump everything, then it really creates this, this legendary status um, amongst your players. It allows your fans to make top 10 list of what's the, you know, the greatest esports moment of this game or it allows fans to debate who is the greatest of all time and then they can start using these moments oh well um, don't you remember that a uh, one time where you know he or she beat so and so four versus one things like that a game that cannot test the that cannot stand the test of time doesn't have this factor um Number two, and again, these are this is a trait that I think every single enduring esport has. Um, the viewing experience should try to mirror what gameplay uh, looks like as much as possible. Now, it's very very common, especially in like the past four years, to understand why this is important. Uh, we have games like uh, like Overwatch which when the Overwatch League first came out was marred by bad headlines and issues about how hard it is to watch. It's very hard to watch the game, but it was really, really fun to play. Now, the reason this was is because when you're trying to watch an eSport, you need to first have a base, ground, like fundamentals, what am I watching? I need to know what's going on. And the best way to do that, to the largest amount of people, is to have, you know, the game you play, that should try to be as close to one-to-one -one as what you're watching. So I have always thought that Super Smash Brothers um, a Melee pretty much accidentally nailed it perfectly when it comes to this. When you watch a game of Super Smash Brothers, it's identical to if you were playing. There's no observer mode and there's no times in which you're disoriented because you know some observer is looking at the wrong thing. Here it is. And even the the a camera even zooms in and out as the characters get farther um, away from each other. I think this has always made Smash Brothers a very fun game to watch, especially if you're a player. Now I'm pretty sure Every single gamer who was born even remotely close to the 90s has played uh, Smash Brothers. And I think that's why there's this instinctive and almost like visceral feeling when you're watching a competitive Smash Brothers. Because you understand what's going on because you understand at least how to play the game. Now, this is, uh, I, I believe this is a screenshot from PUBG or H1Z1. Who knows? Uh, they all look the same to me because all of those esports in my in my opinion, they're already dead. Uh, there's all there's many ways to describe it. Some people call it battle royale, a fatigue, um, but I actually think it's much uh, simpler than that. There was a time in which the battle royale genre could have exploded, but no one figured out, including devs, how to make watching a battle royale feel like playing a battle royale. It just doesn't. Um, when you're playing a battle royale, there's dozens and dozens of players all around you there's danger um, everywhere and you're just one person trying to focus but when you're watching an esport well there's 50 odd uh, pro players each in one match and i'm have to somehow keep track of what's going on when i play a battle royale i'm not rapidly switching 
from different perspectives, it, I'm just focusing on me. I've actually um, enjoyed watching a Battle Royale a tournament so much more when you just see a personal player's stream. You just go to their stream and all of a sudden you're like, okay, now I get a feel of the cadence, I get a feel of who's winning, what's going on. Um, I think that there was like potential here in Battle Royale. I mean, Fortnite obviously has poured tons and tons of money in it, but I still think at the, at the very core core level you're never going to have a battle royale be like an esport that lasts so long because of its inability to have new players be attracted to it um i think i'm somehow hearing myself is there an echo somewhere here one second technical difficulty i think i may need to close twitter somewhere oh well i think it sounds good if there's any audio issues if someone can just um, let me know or something. Send me a DM or anything. Number three, uh, they feature uh, tension and suspense followed by explosive action. So again, we're talking about what makes an eSport last a long time. Now, think about uh, baseball. Do you watch baseball? Do you know someone that watches baseball? Have, have you ever been to a baseball game? Now, personally, I don't like baseball, but I know a lot of people that love it. And I've been to many, many baseball games in my life. And although I think they're incredibly boring, there's something really, really magical when you hear the crack of the bat and the whole, you know, stadium just erupts because someone got a home run. Now, again, I think baseball... The, I think they lucked out. They just so happens to, okay, this is a really fun thing to watch. But there are some esports who I think have captured that same level of excitement. So I, I think StarCraft is one of the best examples of this. Um, StarCraft, I think, accidentally did this. If you, I'm like, remember in the earliest, earliest days of of StarCraft Esports, when you were watching from the observer's perspective, you didn't know the build orders that were going on. You didn't see what units the player was building. You didn't see how much resource they have. There's very limited information. Now, that limited information accidentally created a lot of suspense. Because as you're watching the game, you're like, okay, what's going on? What's going on? And then, bam, suddenly, the observer would move down and pan and you all see the same uh, dark templar or you see the same uh you know a six pool a zergling rush or, or something like that right so you would to get that thrill when you hear the crowd and you'd hear the casters all react in unison oh wow this is happening now funny enough when starcraft 2 came out and we were in a more a modern age of esports in which everyone was clamoring about, oh, we need more robust observer modes. I actually think StarCraft II kind of shot itself in the foot because their observer mode, which was then used as a standard for every single uh, StarCraft II competitive game, they immediately showed whenever a player built a unit. And there were considerably less of those moments in which everyone learn something at the same time and everyone freaks out at the same time. Um, you actually see the same thing in uh, uh, Dota. I actually have a clip that I'd love to share um, that I think really, really sums this up. Let me, uh, let me find it when I'm trying to show you guys. Okay, so here is a clip that uh, most people uh, recognize if you've been in esports for some time, or at least if you like Dota 2. DC are moving in there now. I don't think EG are interested in contesting so this again, five, these Dota 2 games are long. long Sometimes the there's little action. It's very, so, so much suspense, so much tension. And then all of a sudden, a moment like this. It's a disaster, right? <laughs> a six million dollar uh, echo sound. I mean, this is the equivalent of watching someone hit a home run. This is the equivalent of how, why it's so important to have those moments where um, big suspense and then bam, it explodes. I think um, Dota 2, StarCraft, I think CSGO, I even think Super Smash Bros. has a really, really great um, a cadence with this. Now, here's an example of a game that... Uh, actually, no, I thought I had an example. Yes! Heroes of the Storm. So I love 
Heroes of the Storm. I really do. Um, I have put more hours into this game, just almost, almost in terms of like a community building than any other eSport. When this game came out, I was putting on tournaments and I was writing about it and I was playing it. You know, a Blizzard invited me to, to their summits and I was giving balance advice. I really played this game. But man, watching it as an eSport, it had a fundamental problem. There was too much action. I mean, it's crazy. There's too much action. There's too much stuff going on all the time. This actually made it impossible to create that sense of tension because you're sitting there, okay, this objective, this objective, this, this. Actually, a shout outs to the Heroes of the Storm uh, a, a professional uh, casters. They had to keep up with that speed and keep up with that action. And they actually uh, developed what I think is a really unique uh, a cadence. Um, this cadence was extremely fast. You have people like a, a Gillyweed, uh, you have people like Dreadnought, you know, uh, uh, Grubby, some of my favorite uh, casters and heroes, they would talk so fast and they'd have to. I think if Heroes of the Storm just slowed down a bit, I think it could have been a really, really fun esport to watch. But um, we all know how that went. Um, side note, I think Heroes of the Storm is experiencing a like resurgence in terms of just casual uh, gameplay. Game seems to be doing very well. Um, Number four, um, every enduring esport, they make you better at the game just by watching. Now, this is vital. It's so vital for an esport to like live for a long time, right? It's so vital, this. Now, I'm going to show you a clip from a game that I'm sure needs no introduction. Let me see this. Yep, is that the clip? That is it. Okay, so we are going to watch a league of legends clip here absolutely insane let's watch this this is faker doing what faker does best absolutely outplaying on his opponents I'm just gonna let this speak for itself This is why you don't try to gank Faker. <laughs> don't gank a Faker. Uh, so cool, right? So why is this important? Why why do I think this is something that is very vital to League of Legends success? Well, just oh, let me close this. Thanks, Faker. No more of your cool clips. Um, just watching that. If you're a fan of of uh, of League of Legends or like to play League of Legends competitive. You've learned something by watching that. You've learned about, uh, you know, this champion's max, you know, like uh, maneuverability. You've learned about some uh, mind games that you can incorporate. You've learned about, like, you just learn by watching the best players. Um, this is so important because it creates uh, an ecosystem for content creators and streamers to continue uh, teaching fans. If there's one thing you can take from this is that when you can successfully make people watching the game get better at the game they're going to love it because every time they play the game they're going to be thinking about the esport because they're going to be trying to use that strategy or uh, make that play it's very very vital that um in order for this to happen it has to go back to point number two and let me just for uh clarity here Point two is very, very important here. So when you have a viewing experience that mirrors a gameplay, and it's easy to learn because, whoa, it's like I'm watching this game, but I don't have to do all the finger movements. I don't have to have all of the stress. So League of Legends, um, they benefit from that. And also a game that benefits from this is a Street Fighter. Pretty much any version of a 2D uh, fighter. It's very easy to learn. Um, I think if you put an absolute uh, novice versus another absolute novice. Let's just pretend they have like, equal skill levels. But you had one a Street Fighter player watch like five hours of competitive Street Fighter and then play, guaranteed the person who played, I mean who watched, would win. And that's because watching a Street Fighter is very, very intuitive. You can see why the other opponent is winning. He's either dodging the attacks or she's getting... Um, a good counter hits and all of a sudden you start learning oh maybe it's more than just 
I'm mashing buttons. Oh, that's why I lose because I jump too much. Uh, again, shout outs to commentators. Uh, some of the, I think the most skilled veteran uh, commentators in esports come from the fighting game uh, community. And they're able to not only teach the game while they're commentating, but also bring hype. So I'm um, shout out to that. And I swear to God, I'm not trying to dunk on Blizzard or Overwatch when I give the bad examples. But Overwatch is probably one of the worst examples of how watching a game doesn't make you better. Um, watching competitive Overwatch League, it's very hard to learn um, because at the end of the day, you're just one player. Um, Overwatch requires six players to do anything. It's very rare for one player, you know, with, um, with an Overwatch to kill six players or, you know, kill uh, a group of players that overwhelm him. So there's not much of that outplay um, potential. Not to mention when you're watching an Overwatch League match, the camera's moving all over the place. And again, these, these aren't digs at Overwatch. I think Overwatch is a very, very well-made game. And if you try to say that it's eSport isn't a success, well, then you need to, to, to like redefine your version of success. But do I think Overwatch will be, you know, like around as long as Smash Brothers, as long as CSGO, as long as... No way. No way. And it's simply because there's that a fundamental a disconnect. There's a disconnect between watching it. There's a disconnect between learning from the pros. And there's just many, many reasons why. So with that said, now that I've kind of talked about um, the points, I want to go back to this video. I want to go back to this video. Uh, let me see. That shouldn't have happened. All right. Solo manning the stream here is pretty fun. So let's go back here. Boop, boop, doop. Uh, that it? Nope. Ah, here we go. Cool. So let's go back to this video. And I wanted to kind of uh, talk through this as it plays, and we can kind of um, revisit those points I made. So again, why is this moment so great? Because one player um, defeated five. This is a moment that CSGO fans can talk about. And this too is so important. Look at the hype it creates. Look at the narratives it creates. I would love to have been a journalist in this room here because I could have asked so many questions about that experience. I could have asked the players losing. How did it feel to get, you know, one v a five there i could have talked to um guardian about how good it felt all of that and all that narrative and even fandom comes from those outplay moments so this is trait uh, number two uh and again i think fighting games show this great it's very intuitive um when you're watching a fighting game it's like you're uh, playing a fighting game there's no like observer mode and uh, now obviously I'm going to somehow include a Daigo moment uh, here, this parry. Um, this is the perfect example. If you ever played Third Strike, then your respect for this clip is so much higher because you understand what's going on. There's no observer mode that's getting in your way of really loving this esports. So cool. And this is also the problem that I mentioned. So, uh, Battle Royale games are great, but it's so hard to try to capture all the stuff going on. Not to mention, when you do capture the stuff going on, it's not really uh, mirroring what you're used to seeing. So, it's very, very hard, I think, for those games to survive um, a long term. Here again, uh, just a, a um, another recap. This is the tension. This is the suspense that every, I think, enduring esport has. Uh, these moments like this, they're why uh, fans want to go pro themselves. They're why uh, people tune in. And it's this like suspense that I think MOBAs are really lucky to have. Um, um, Here's the Storm, again, I think fails a little bit because there's too much action. And it makes these emotional, um, suspenseful moments hard to really pinpoint. Uh, here's Faker again, just destroying people. And again, the point here um, and why I think it's important that a League of Legends has players like Faker is because there's something to be inspired by. Just watching these players do um, um, what they do, it 
uh, makes you better. And, you know, like whether that's trying to learn a build order or whether that's trying to, you know, copy their a loadout from point A to point B in a game like CSGO. Uh, I think that the ability to learn about the game as you're watching the game is very, very important. Um, so, yeah, that being said, uh, let me just go back to my ooh, slide here. Um, so yeah, these are what I think are the most important things that make an enduring eSport. Uh, do I think that devs can uh, learn from past eSports? Yes. For one, I think there's way too much um, emphasis on an observer mode. I think that observer modes should try to get out of the player way out of the player's way. They shouldn't try to be jam-packing so much information. I think you see a lot of, we borrow, um, well, eSports often borrows from uh, traditional sports, and I think they do so in the worst way. I think um, traditional sports like football and, you know, those broadcasts are made better by all the stats and all of the information, but I don't think eSports need that. I think you need to get out of the way and just let the gameplay speak for themselves. Um, so yeah, anyways, this was my uh, talk. You can actually read the original um, article that I wrote. Um, you can just go to invenglobal.com. Uh, you can follow me at nickdrazio3rd on Twitter. And if you're watching this on Twitter, uh, you should definitely follow um, Inven Global. We put on these type of lectures every single Tuesday, uh, just trying to teach the rest of the industry what we know about esports to be true and you know kind of raise the level of discourse um also we're having a, a panel on friday so we have digital panels every single friday um uh this week's panel is all about content uh, creation it's all about how to avoid um kind of doing the same old same old in this very um, oversaturated market uh, there's tons and tons of people wanting um, esports content, so that means there's a lot of people trying to make esports content. So we're going to uh, bring on a bunch of pro streamers, pro content creators, and have a really good panel about the practical advice you can do to get better. So um, my name is Nick Durazio. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and yeah, you guys have a great day. Go play some esports, and uh, I will talk to you later. Thanks for listening.